So hi, and uh, welcome to the Festival of Martial Arts podcast again. My name is Matt State, and I'm joined by Lee Hasdall. So hi, Lee. Hi, yeah. How's it going? <laughs> uh, it's great, my friend. I'm firstly, really, really pleased that you're going to come along and uh, participate in the Festival of Martial Arts. Really excited about that, really looking forward to that. But um, what I'd like to do today is just have a little overview of things. Firstly, who you are, what you do, what you're doing now, what you're going to bring to the festival, uh, things like that. So if we start right at the very beginning, which is, who are you? Okay, yeah. Just before we do that, I just want to say thank you for the invitation uh, to oh, this event. I think, I think it's a great idea. Uh, as you know, and I'm sure most people are aware, I'm a big fan of innovation, uh, especially when it comes to the martial arts, uh, offering different ways of presenting the martial arts and, and hopefully to, uh, I guess, a wider, wider wider field of people. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah. Well, um, okay. I don't want to take up all of the time with my history because it's quite... It's quite a long history. Um, I did start martial arts around about 10 years old. Um, I kind of dipped in and out of martial arts because I had some uh, injuries through athletics. So that kind of uh, prevented a lot of my martial arts stuff when I was young. But once um, once my body healed around about the age of 16, 17, um, I went straight into karate or back to karate. And then back then it was only really, <clears throat> it was only really judo, karate or what else was there? Yeah, that's about it. Uh, boxing, sorry, yeah. Uh, so when I was doing karate, I always had this kind of inclination to want to box. Um, now, at the place where I studied, they had uh, karate on Tuesday, boxing on Thursday. So what I, what I decided to do was karate on Tuesday, um, boxing on Thursday. But when I was doing karate, I always wanted to box. When I was doing boxing, I always wanted to kick. Uh, and sometimes... Through, through, through an accident, I would uh, get it the wrong way around. I'd get a little bit confused. Anyway, and this was way before kickboxing was around, because this was in the uh, in the 80s, early 80s. So kickboxing wasn't really a thing back then. Anyway, I, I followed my um, training in karate, and I went to various tournaments and that, and, and, and I did very, very well. My coach actually said to me, look, there's a thing called kickboxing. I said, I think you'd be really good at kickboxing. So... I found a school in Milton Keynes um, that was with Brian Walker and Master Toddy. That was a mixture of full contact karate and Mai Tai. So I, I joined there and you could you could say that was the kind of beginning of my career, uh, at least a professional career. And I did take to kickboxing very, very well. Because like I say, when I was young, I always, always had this kind of uh, intuition about boxing and, and kicking from karate. Yeah. So um, that's where I started my kickboxing career. Uh, now, the the classes there were really tough. It was like real old school training. I don't remember a class with more than six people in. Okay, so um, it was that tough. And when people turned up, it was almost like not if they were going to stay or leave. It was how long it was going to take them to be sick. <laughs> so it was a real old school stuff. Um, but one of the problems was... It, we never had enough people. I don't remember a class more than, I don't know, let's say eight eight people. So financially, uh, the coach was always struggling. Um, and in the end, he called it a day because he had his business to take care of. And he said to me at the time, and this was uh, around about uh, 1989 or something, 88 maybe. He said, look, if you really want to pursue kickboxing, get yourself out to Holland. And... Um, so as a young lad, I went straight out to Holland and I started training in Holland. And as most people are aware, kickboxing in Holland is massive. Mm. OK, uh, it's kind of like the the mecca of kickboxing uh, in Europe, if not the world. Mm. Uh, for some reason, the Dutch have dominated kickboxing and even Mai Tai for um, quite a few decades now. Mm. So and then one thing I noticed when I was out there was how popular it was. And all of the classes, they had around about 20 even 30 people per class. And yet they were able to produce tough world-class mm. fighters. And this kind of captured my attention because of what happened in the, in the previous school. Um, it was a brilliant school, but we just didn't have the numbers. And, and I know every martial art instructor will always have this kind of um, problem where uh, quality, quantity, um, how commercial to be, you know, you've got bills to pay, 
Uh, and also, if you if you want to be tough and you want to produce world class professional fighters, you do you do need a good pool, as in mm. uh, lots of people to select mm. them from. Anyway, the Dutch seem to have mastered this, and basically what it was, they had a, almost like a two tier system. So they had their kind of open kickboxing, and then they would have their fighters class. Mm. Okay, back then that was kind of unheard of. It was just like you just did kickboxing, and if you couldn't hack it, you didn't stay. Uh, and for those that could stayed. But it meant that it was uh, massively reduced. Anyway, so when I come back to the UK, I actually set up my own kickboxing school or academy, and I applied those principles, and it worked. And I call it the the, the golden the golden days or the golden age. Uh, this would have been around right about when uh, Jean Claude Van Damme and the kickboxer movie came out. Uh, I guess it was early nineties. So there was kind of a kickboxing boom, and um, so I, when I come back and open my school. I was getting, I kid you not, I was getting around about 60 to 70 people mm. per class in a big sports hall. Mm. That's yeah. a big class, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why I call it the the, the, the golden age or the golden days of kickboxing. Um, and I was the only kickboxing school probably at least maybe 30 to 40 mile radius. Right. Uh, yeah. Now, kickboxing is pretty much everywhere. Anyway, that lasted for quite a few years. And... Um, I will try and speed it up a bit. When when I was teaching in Milton Keynes, um, there was a, a Japanese boarding school because in Milton Keynes, there was quite a lot of Japanese businesses. So the business um, community decided to set up a Japanese boarding school so that the directors that were based in um, the UK, in Milton Keynes, could actually have their children with them studying. Mm. Yeah. Now, part of, part of that complex, they, they built two dojos because the, uh, the Japanese curriculum uh, normally involves martial arts, your karate, judo, your kendo. Um, so they had space available. And because at the time I'd just come back from Japan fighting in the K1, this would have been around about 1992, they um, they offered me space to teach there. And uh, I remember, because back then, uh, K1 was massive. So- Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the, the teachers of the karate, the judo, the kendo, and jiu-jitsu, uh, they approached me one night and said, ah, ah, Lisan, Lisan, please teach K1, K1. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I would arrange these classes where I would train with them. And and these these Japanese teachers were sort of fifth, sixth dan, judo, jiu-jitsu, karate, and, and um, they had kendo teachers. So I, there was a few of us training together. And I felt embarrassed to charge them because they said, oh, how much? And I was like... I felt, yeah, I just felt embarrassed to take money from them. So I said, I'll tell you what, let's do a trade-off. I'll train you in K1 kickboxing and you train me in what you know. Okay. And bearing in mind, this was probably just before UFC won. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the whole concept of cross-training, mixed martial arts, uh, hybrid fighting, all that, it wasn't really a thing. So in these classes that we set up, we ended up doing uh, kickboxing, uh, takedowns, throws, ground fighting. And just as an extra, um, the teacher that taught the kendo, he also did weapons. So we'd also include a bit of weaponry in the training sessions as the trade-off. And you could say that was my kind of first glimpse of mixed martial arts. Anyway, um, maybe a year, a year later, I was in Japan uh, at a K1 event. I was a standby fighter. So I didn't have to fight. I could sit at ringside watching the fights and they had this MMA fight. And I said to my manager, I said, that's what we're doing in the UK. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, what you're seeing right now, we're training like that, kick, punch, take down, submission. Uh, and he kind of said, well, yeah, whatever. And I said, no, that's the future. That's gotta be the future. Um, so when I got come back to the UK, I um, actually put an advert in the martial art magazines asking for different uh, people from different styles to contact me we would get together and we would train in this kind of cross-training hybrid um, uh, multi-combat system, you could say. Uh, and I did actually get quite a few people come forwards. Anyway, by this point, I had my own full-time gym and I had accommodation with it. So they would come and stay, we'd get together, pretty much the same thing. We didn't really know what we were doing. We mm. were just kind of uh, bodging it together. So I had somebody from judo, somebody from wrestling, somebody from sambo, somebody from jiu-jitsu, kickboxing Mai Tai and we would just literally train together we'd lock the door 
Um, we'd jump in the ring and we'd spar for hours and hours and hours. We'd, we'd occasionally get videos. Um, back then it was VHS videos uh, <laughs> from, I don't know, anywhere we could find them. Uh, we normally had to order them um, from magazines and stuff. So we'd sit and watch them. And we'd just piece it all together like a jigsaw puzzle. And of course, uh, you know, I, I was very skilled in kickboxing. There was a guy who's very skilled in sambo, so on and so forth. But there was always this one thing that was missing, and it was how to link them all up. Mm. It's almost like uh, like the lubrication that that joins all these kind of uh, different styles together, yeah. and that really that caught my attention. So I, I heavily focused on that. Um, I'll try and speed it up a bit. Uh, I then got invited out to Holland to fight uh, MMA. Uh, I thought that uh, back then it, there, there wasn't this kind of a unified rule system. So one week you would fight with this rule, next week you'd fight with another rule, so on and so forth. There was no regulations. Uh, pretty much most promotions made it up as they went along. Um, so back then, if you didn't win by knockout or submission, it was it was a draw. Uh, and like I say, the, the rules progressed. We're talking around about 1995, 96. Um, and it was gaining momentum. And then I went back out to Japan and I spoke to the Japanese guys and I said, look, I, I want to do a promotion in the UK. So uh, around about 1996, yeah, 96, 97, we did the first UK promotion. Um, we actually featured um, full contact MMA. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody else has researched it, but from what I can figure out, it was the first professional MMA fight in the UK uh, yeah. which, me which meant we wore the small gloves which which I got from Japan we did ground and pound, five minute rounds uh, basically knockout or submission and we had uh, some people from the media because it kind of got a lot of media because the UFC would, were, were pushing this kind of no rules mm. cockfighting banned in every state or whatever Yeah, there was all that so it caught the media's attention they jumped all over it <clears throat> and they basically tried to to get it banned in the UK, and um, and this is possibly something uh, at, at your event. I wouldn't I wouldn't mind doing a talk upon because uh, I won't go into it too much now. But basically, I s had to single handedly take on uh, the British Medical Association uh, lawyers, the environmental health, the councils, the media, so on and so forth. And uh, long story short, I was able to get Milton Keynes to agree that it was okay to do it. They were literally about to ban it. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. It entails the legalities. Um, it, it, it entails like uh, consent, you know, what mm. uh, two adults consent to do. Um, I'll give you a, a quick mm. snippet. In the meeting, they were about to ban it. And, as, and bearing in mind, I didn't have a lawyer. Or, you know, I, don't, I, I didn't really know too much about how things work. I had to figure it out um, on my feet. Um, I stood up in the meeting. I said, look, you do realize if you if you go ahead and ban this, the consequences of the presence that you're setting means that you, ha you have to bring into question tattoos, body piercing, mm. because if if an adult or two adults consent to do whatever, it's, it's no longer assault. It's no longer an offense mm. um, because they're consenting adults. Now, and I said, to them, as long as you put parameters in guidelines regulations uh and i said to you i said to them i'll, I'll put together it's around about 40 page document with the with the rules regulations right. conditions and I, I remember standing there looking at them and none of them had actually thought of that of the mm. consequences of the ripple effect of banning a combat sport in the uk it meant it would mean that it would bring into question all of the other things that adults decide to do consensually yeah yeah um so they gave me a couple of weeks, I produced a document and they accepted it. And you could pretty much say that was the blueprint for MMA in the UK. Mm. And that no, would have that, been around that, about 1998. Yeah, that, that's fascinating because the, 
Um, again, I don't want to. I, I want to sort of catch up to where where we are now. But it's sure. fascinating because you've given so much information already. But <laughs> um, the the UFC version of what you've just described is pretty well documented over the years of how they were banned everywhere and how they had to, you know, build up the rules and they had to put things in place so that they would get um, get licensed in various states and things. Um, but there isn't really that much information out in regards to how that transpired in the UK. Um, and you being one sure. of the absolute sort of pioneers in the country and everything, as you, as you just said then i um it, it, it's fascinating to learn that history and how that all developed and everything so um yeah i mean that would make a great presentation anything in and around that would be uh, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's one of those where um, we could do a much longer form podcast and go into it in much greater detail. And that would be fabulous. Um, we don't yeah. really have the time in this particular no. one because of the constraints, unfortunately. But again, it would make a fabulous presentation. So. Um, so going on from there. Yeah. Um, because yeah. there's there's a list, isn't there, of people that you fought and things that you've done, which is uh, pretty, pretty impressive, to put it mildly. Yeah. Well, the reason why I made that point when I was young, it's almost like I had uh, some kind of intuition uh, or or even uh, uh, a prediction of the future. So even when I was young and I had this idea of well, why can't you do boxing and kickboxing? Um, you know, everybody was kind of so rigid in in their thinking, but it made far more sense to me that if you're going to try and defend yourself or fight or whatever you want to call it, you want to use every tool available. Why would you intentionally restrict yourself to to only using this or only using that so even as a kid i had this kind of idea um and then uh, obviously years later um i realized why uh and the whole you could say martial arts world um went into some kind of um recapit recapitulation about uh what everybody thought you should or shouldn't do or what you could or couldn't do uh you could say the boundaries and the walls were, were completely smashed to pieces with the advent of the ufc um, and I, I may just add that in Japan, they were already doing this. Um, mm. The UFC was kind of new to the West, but in Japan, and in fact, if you look back into the history of even jiu-jitsu, even the samurai, I remember finding and reading some documents um, or training notes of the samurai. And it literally said something like uh, Monday, swimming, Tuesday, striking, Wednesday, swords, Thursday, uh, strength and conditioning, so on and so forth. Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so they were literally doing, you could say, mixed martial arts or multi combat systems back then. Mm. At the end of the day, if you're in a bat, if you're on the battlefield, you have to take whatever weapon will get you the victory. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, bringing it back up to sort of up to date. So I've always been involved with this kind of mindset of innovation with how to integrate different arts. And um, in, when my career come to an end, uh, and like you say, I fought all around the world. I fought in Russia, uh, predominantly in Japan and Russia. That was where I mainly fought. But I also went to places like uh, France and uh, Holland, uh, Italy. Uh, I won the world title in Italy, uh, which, was, which was a massive event. Um, when my career started coming to an end, uh, which was around about 2000, the beginning of the millennium, and I realized I, I was going to have to pack my bags and come back to the UK kind of permanently, uh, I decided to try to document all of the things that I'd learned. Because when I was in Japan, I was studying with different teachers, different masters, um, and I was always big into the martial arts, not just the combat sports. A lot of people don't realize this. Uh, I always uh, did my gradings. I always used to like wearing the, the uh, gi. Uh, I like the gi techniques. I like all of the tradition. But I often found that when you studied tradition, it kind of lost the um, effectiveness of the techniques. But then when you go to combat sports, which is purely uh, effectiveness of techniques, they didn't have any sort of tradition. Mm. They didn't have the martial arts. In my mind, I always had a vision that there must be a way to unify the two. So you've got mm -hmm. a highly effective um, martial art combat system, but you've got all the trims and the dressings, traditions of, say, Japanese martial arts. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2000, what I'd, I decided to do was to document all of the stuff I'd learned uh, and put together a, a kind of training system, knowing that I was coming back to the UK. Uh, and when I did that, 
I couldn't fi- I couldn't figure out a name. So I, I spoke to the Japanese guys that I was training with and they said, well, Senjutsu sounds good. Uh, so I, I called it Senjutsu back then. Um, when I came back to the UK, I thought I need to kind of formulate some kind of organization of some sort. Um, because I know at some point, maybe I'm going to need it for, to deal with uh, councils and so on and so forth, mm. uh, sports centers and recognition. So uh, I developed an association called uh, Combined Budo Association. And I wanted to put Budo in there because I wanted it to be recognized that it does have the, the more traditional aspects of the martial arts, as mm. opposed to call it just uh, combat. Anyway, so we called it, uh, uh, we called it Combined Budo um, Association at that time. Uh, and then I wanted to, sh- I needed to shorten the name down uh, for, for the website purposes. <laughs> so um, I called it kombudo.com. That was the mm-hmm. original uh, website back then. And then when I was kind of uh, sketching and drawing, because I'm into design and stuff like that, um, I'm, I'm quite innovative in, 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 in the way I think, in the way I, I express myself. I realized that Com, com could mean many different things. It could mean center of mass. It could mean combat. It could mean complete. So I wrote a little kind of a uh, few paragraphs about the concept of kombudo. And when I started saying the word kombudo, it kind of stuck. So mm. now we call it kombudo. Uh, but it actually means uh, complete, combined, combat, budo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that So that brings us pretty much up to today. Yeah. And right now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, the, the, your your history is fascinating. And, and I mean, you didn't really say that much about it, but apart from saying you're in Japan, but you lived there for a period of time and you trained there yeah. and, and that was, you know, you immersed yourself in it fully way more than, um, than a lot of other people get the opportunities to do. So, um, so that yeah. must reflect in the way that you put Kombudu together in the sense that all of that, um, you know, all of that way of life, all of that way of living and being, because it is different. Uh, in yep. Japan, than than you know, we we allude to it in our, in our training a lot of the time, but it's a completely different way of being. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. And so, yeah. how how much of that has has sort of come with you, if you like? Well, one of the other aspects is that I've always been a kind of spiritual person, and, and I've always uh, had a, a, a deep understanding of, of the mental applications. So, as an example, when I was doing my professional fighting, uh, the physical training could be perfect. But um, if the mind wasn't ready, if if the mindset wasn't uh, completed, you would have a poor performance. Mm. And a lot of uh, athletes um, in any any capacity, they'll all they'll all agree with this, that it's it could actually be uh, 80 to 90 percent mental Mm. Um, and it's way less physical. So as an example, I could have prepared myself physically perfectly but maybe there was some kind of mental dis- distraction or, or mental weakness or something like that. And it'd be a very bad performance. Equally, I remember getting um, uh, not even phone calls, but faxes. <laughs> do you remember the fax machines? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I would literally get a fax from Japan saying, do you want to fight? Uh, and I would ask when, and they'll say this weekend. So I had like zero preparation. Mm. Okay. So, uh, I would say, yeah, sure. And I'd literally jump on a plane, fly out to Japan, fight, and I'd have the best performance of my life. So okay. as a coach, as as a professional athlete, you've got to ask the question, how comes I can do a full 12-week camp and have a, a terrible performance, and yet I can have a zero camp and beat the best in the world? Mm. What is it? Well, it's it's the mindset. It's the attitude. It's the spirit. Uh, and it's also the performance anxiety. Mm. Uh, so I started to, you know, that, as you can imagine, that actually brings into question a lot of things about how, <clears throat> excuse me, about how we train, how we prepare, um, the emotional um, preparation, mental preparation, uh, and unifying all of that and mm. working that together. And also the fighting spirit. Mm. So I, 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 I dug into all of that Um Bearing in mind that I was actually fighting, coaching, uh, running a business simultaneously. So we've only got so many hours in a day. But once once I stopped uh, fighting full time, uh, you could say that I dove deeply into the sort of mind, body, spirit aspects of, of the martial arts. Mm. And um, 
yeah, so I sought out different people, different um, methodologies mm -hmm. from NLP all the way through to meditation. Mm -hmm. And I always had the question, why did the samurai supposedly invest so much time into Zen meditation? Was it because they wanted to be spiritual? Was it because they wanted to live a monastic life? Most of the time it wasn't. It was to make them um, invincible on the battlefield. It was to make them more efficient at the, in the art of killing, mm. <laughs> which goes completely contrary to the, the notion of Buddhism or Zen or anything like that. Yeah, again, it's very interesting topics, isn't it? And again, something that would make a really good presentation um, mm. in regards to the festival and things. And there's uh, there's there's so many sort of conversations in and around that. It's 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 a subject all by itself. Um, now, when we when we look forward, I can see uh, see behind you on the wall there. We've got the off, off grid dojo. So this is something sure. else that you're doing now as well, isn't it? Which is uh, worth just mentioning and letting people know what that is. Yeah, well, okay. Um, I, I, I've had a dojo for around about 30 years now. Um, I've had a few pauses. Um, but it's always been taken care of by my instructors. It's normally when I've had to travel abroad overseas and, and uh, do other things. Um, now, in 2020, I, I lost my dojo during the um, lockdowns. And uh, I was very hesitant. Um, I, I won't bore everybody with the, with the detail, but Basically, uh, financially, I lost quite a lot of money. Um, I didn't get the sort of compensation that I was expected to get. Uh, so I decided to possibly call call it a day with regards to running a physical dojo. Um, but through sort of popular demand, uh, people wanting to train, I set up what I then called was the off-grid dojo. Uh, it wasn't particularly planned. It wasn't even the name. It's just when people would ask me, well, what is, what is a dojo called? I was like, well, uh, off-grid dojo. Um, so it became more of a concept, more of a mindset. So basically what it means is, is that, because um, I'm sure you remember back in 2020, um, we would, everybody was having to train outdoors, mm -hmm. to train different random locations in the woods, in the park. Well, I've always been a fan of that anyway. So it kind of gave me a green light to do what I'd like doing anyway. And I used to have to force people out of the dojo to go to the woods, to go to the park. Uh, now it was kind of normal. Uh, so I realized it was a good opportunity for me to actually uh, pursue an interest of outdoor training, um, which I actually preferred and, and, and kind of liked. So I, I set up what, what is now known as the off-grid dojo. Um, I did have a, a space on a, on a farm, which is in the middle of nowhere. That did pose a few problems with regards to people coming to me. Um, and then I realized, well, actually, it's a mindset. Uh, you can train martial arts anywhere. Mm. And um, another aspect is, uh, for those who don't know, um, I part of part of one of my businesses is uh, protection dogs. So uh, it's it's uh, the training um, of protection dogs and training the owners of protection dogs how to handle the dogs and so on and so forth. And and, and a big part of that training is is what is known as environmental training. Um, what that basically means is is that you uh, you have to allow the dog to experience as many different types of environments as possible. So daytime, nighttime, slippery floors, stairs, um, dark, scary rooms, uh, bright lights, water, you name it. As many different things as possible so that the dog is conditioned to any type of situation or scenario. So that when the dog has to protect, there's not going to be any failings. Anyway, then that got me thinking, well, for self-defense, for personal protection, for combatives, really, we need the same mindset. Mm, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So off-grid dojo is a concept. Uh, it basically means that we can train anywhere. Uh, somebody may call me um, and I'll meet up with them in the park, um, different locations, and I may even suggest them, let's train at nighttime. Let's train in the dark. Mm. <laughs> Train in the park uh, in the dark why not um yeah so that's, mm. that's again different. a fantastic concept and it's um <laughs> because i remember we did we took similar pathways uh, in regards to um you know we we both set up premises that are 
that, that, are, that are enclosed and, and, and we can train and train others in those situations. So I bought a property that had that, you know, and we, and I built that on as part of that. Um, yep. And again, with the, with the vans, we've both taken that direction as well, mostly for fun. Um, but then you're also, you've also expanded out from just the martial arts aspect of it into more survival things, more better living, more, um, you know, yeah. more skill sets that aren't just the, the martial aspects of it, but it's all encompassing, isn't it? I mean, that's again, I think yeah. where we align quite a lot in the sense that I, I think there's uh, when, when we look at self-defense, if we're going to use that term, it's a much broader church than just learning how to punch somebody in the face. Um, yeah. And so again, with, with, with that, with yourself, I know you're, you're very keen on a lot of, again, just to give it a title um, sort of survivalist skill sets yeah. and that kind of thing. So how does that sit in with everything else that you do? Well, when I, when I retired from fighting, um, I kind of had this uh, real, almost like a midlife crisis where if you imagine I was a professional fighter uh, in Japan training um, and then flying out to Russia doing these kind of uh, literally underground type fights. So it was very much adrenaline based mm -hmm. and I was being fueled by adrenaline. When, when, when I uh, called it a day, my adrenaline was up here and then all of a sudden I was expected to live a sort of mundane, ordinary life. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted a replacement. So I started looking into different things. Um, I actually uh, joined the military as a, a physical training instructor. Um, so that opened me to all kinds of outdoor activities. Um, I got into uh, climbing, walking, kayaking, um, pretty much anything that would give me a, a, an adrenaline hit. Um, and I also got into outdoor stuff, camping, uh, survival. And it, it was very kind of easy for me to realize there's definitely a correlation between your typical self-defense and say as an example the ability to swim mm. um kicking down a door uh first aid uh how to start a fire these are all forms of of defense of, of mm. personal protection and um <clears throat> as as we've already uh discussed i i like to think outside of the box i like to innovate so i started to incorporate these you could say additions to my my kind of basic uh, self-defense training so it could be the case that i would uh either take students swimming or say to them look there's a swimming club if you can't swim go there first then come back and i'll teach you something mm. yeah because to me if you can't swim what's the point in learning pretty much uh, anything else connected to survival or personal protection um client how to climb a, a nine foot ten foot twelve foot wall things like that because uh your best chance of survival in in self-defense is often to run away but it, what happens if you get bottlenecked or dead-ended you might need to climb a wall mm. so these kind of small skill sets um same way of kicking down the door um <clears throat> i actually got a friend of mine years ago to construct a, a door frame um where it was literally a door that we would screw on and students would have to kick it down or kick through it. <laughs> it may yep. seem like irrelevant, but you could be locked in a house. You could be locked in a building that the building's on fire. You yep. need to get out. Um, you know, how to, um, and, 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 and kicking down a door is not as easy as what it sounds. There is actually a technical kind of a scientific aspect to it as well. So all these little things, um, uh, and like I say, the way my mind works, uh, I've often been described as a polymath or syncretist or something like that, uh, which basically means if you present me with 10 different items, my first impressions will be what is the same? Mm. What are the similarities in these things? Not what is the difference? Mm. So I'm able to unify things quite quite well. And, and I guess um, my life and, and lifestyle is a result of, of doing those things, mm. especially with the martial arts. Yeah, yeah, no. I think I, again, I, it, it's something that you're preaching to the choir in regards to a certain <laughs> aspect of people because there's there's enough evidence in the world. We've seen enough of of that in the world to know that these skills are quite often the skills that actually help people to get through various things that are going on in the world. You know, there's um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not always a, a one dimensional response, as uh, you know, as you say there. Um, and and what's interesting about that, I think now is we're 
as we move you know into the next phase whatever that may look like with technology mm -hmm. with the ability yeah. to sort of reach out globally in an instant and all of that is where everything is now going to sort of go to and, and what it's going to become and it's a fan fascinating journey um yeah. and it's great talking to somebody like yourself because as you've said they're from you know, from the 80s, from the beginning, um, and, and it being very, very rudimentary. And that's not yeah. a criticism on anybody or anything, but um, mm. that's how it was into, into what it's become over the years, into what we see now and what we go into in the future. It's great that you're still, as you say, innovating and coming up with concepts and ideas to, to push yeah. that envelope that little bit further. So um, I mean, it's really exciting now thinking about what you're going to bring to the table with regards to the festival, because, sure. you know, we, we've got a great deal of space. We've got all that woodland. We've got um, all kinds of opportunities to run with so many of the ideas that you discussed there. Um, yeah. So really looking forward to, uh, to, to hear about how those ideas develop and what you're actually going to do when the time comes. Um, yeah. Have you got any ideas in mind or, or is that something that you'll just sort of um, work out near the time? Yeah, well, I, I want to sort of um, not not necessarily push the kombudo concept, but um, maybe some of the ideas we can do some of the training. So there's certain techniques that we incorporate, which um, you could say like the kind of hardcore self defense techniques, like uh, headbutts and um, open palm strikes. Um, quite often, when they're taught in terms of a self defense um, concept, there's not much science that goes behind it. There's not much uh, even sports coaching. So what uh, I've been able to do over time is to develop kind of a more of a scientific approach, a more technical approach to some of these rudimentary uh, techniques that we just assume will work okay on the night or the time when we need them. Um, so there's lots of different ways of training, say a headbutt, as opposed to just saying, well, just headbutt them. Mm. Um, the same, It'd be the same way as a boxing coach, just saying, uh, throw your left hand out as a jab. Yeah. That's a whole science, you know, the, the art of throwing a jab. You can break it right down into a complete um, science, physics, uh, time in motion, and all of these um, uh, factors. So in Kombudo, we've, we've taken some of the, I guess, the uh, basic self-defense techniques um, and built around it like a training mechanism, training support, uh, coaching uh, methodology, uh, to enhance it so that in the in 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 the event, unfortunate event that we may need these techniques, they're not going to fail. So we kind of apply the same principle that a sports athlete or combat athlete would have mm -hmm. with any of their techniques. Um, and then there's you could probably say the sort of psychophysical side. Um, I'll be quite happy to run uh, maybe a workshop or even give a talk uh, about some of the relevance or the importance of maybe harmonizing. Because we always hear this kind of mind, body, and spirit, and all of this stuff, um, but it's it's not so simple. Um, well, it's simple, but it's not so easy to actually apply them in our training, and um, even just with slight adjustment to how we we um, we even view ourselves in in the way we we train, um, the way we operate uh, when we approach the martial arts, uh, we can make a lot of difference. So mm. stuff like that as well, and then. Um, Possibly, I don't know, it depends how much time you give me, how much of a platform. Maybe I could give a brief talk into the history of mixed martial arts in the UK. Well, fantastic. Well, I think, um, yeah, obviously it'd be great to have you there and we want to make the most of your knowledge and experience. Um, so I think that's something maybe we can put out to the audience and say, well, what is it that you want to hear from Lee? You know, what is it that you want to, what information do you want uh, to get? So that's something perhaps we can put out there. So that's that's great. Now, in the meantime, between now and then, how can people reach you if they want to? Okay, uh, probably the best way to contact me will be to go to the website, which is kombudo dot org so it's c-o-m budo dot org uh, okay. and on there there's a link uh, to my email uh, so you just press the link and uh, you can be in contact with me and um, also on facebook we've got uh, our kombudo page uh, it's actually under uh, combat budo organization so that's probably the best way for people to contact me okay fantastic well uh thank you very much for your time today and having a chat and um really look forward to seeing you at the festival my friend yeah, and I just want to thank you as well. And, uh, I, you know, I fully support your innovation and uh, bringing these festivals forward. I, I think it's going to be fantastic, especially if we can uh, 
incorporate all of these different modalities regarding well, the martial arts. That's very much the hope, buddy. So thank you very much. Thank you.